Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we'll get even more familiar with the masterpieces of the British civil aviation industry. This time the protagonist of our story is perhaps the most famous creation of its motherland, whose awesomeness is matched only by its dramatic fate. Hawker Siddeley HS-121 Trident A mid-range jet airliner developed by de Havilland and brought to the sky by the Hawker Siddeley Group in the beginning of the 1960s. It is the first jet airliner to have a T-tail and three engines in the aft section, which became quite a popular configuration in its time. At least the Boeing 727 and the Tu-154 can be regarded as its younger brothers. Let's see how this marvel came to life and find out why it ended up succumbing to its foreign relatives. The British civil aviation industry of the 1950s had lots of quite unusual particularities. Boasting a great deal of technologies and experience, the local aviators were quite literally at the cutting edge of the industry, creating the most advanced airplanes of the time. The first jet airliners started soaring through the air, and the first turboprops swiftly followed suit. This division of the sky made sense. The mighty de Havilland Comets were reigning the long-range flights, while the smaller Vickers Vicon did the same on the original ones. Both of them were on an entirely new level compared to what was flying before. Turboprops were developed quite actively in the Albion. They were reliable, cheap and easy to operate, which in many cases made them the best option. But time does not stop, and in spite of the shocking crashes of the Comet, it became obvious that the jet engines were superior. A breakthrough in this regard was the Sudovietsion Caravel, a original airliner which proved that jet power was pretty good on the shorter distances too. The first company to reconsider its plans was British European Airways, or BEA, which published a new vision of its operations. They wanted to have jet airliners for both regional and mid-range flights, leaving the turboprops as the thing of the past. This gave a boost to several projects. The first line of work resulted in the creation of the regional BAC-111, while the second one had to be a larger mid-range airliner. The task was taken on by the biggest manufacturers of the country, Bristol, Avro, Vickers and de Havilland. The project of de Havilland turned out to be the most successful. At first they thought about modifying the Comet, but with time, the concept labeled as DH-121 ended up being completely different. It received an entirely new airframe and three engines. It was a compromise. Four engines were a bit too much, whilst two were a bit too few for a mid-range jet. They would not have enough thrust, and safety was an issue. At first this airplane resembled the three-engine caravel, but as the time went on, the third engine was embedded into the fuselage and the tail got a T-shaped configuration. It was supposed to accommodate 111 passengers and have a range of 3300 kilometers, or 1800 miles. But in the end of the 1950s, right when the project was on its advanced stages, the industry got submerged in the turbulent water of reforms and consolidations. And so, de Havilland was joined by hunting aircraft and ferry aviation in the DH-121 project, in what became the Airco Corporation. At the same time the competing project, Type 200, was developed by Bristol and Hawker Siddeley. The fight was fierce and as if it was not enough, on the other side of the pond Boeing came up with a project of its own, also a trijet. It was a problem for the British. If the Americans will have an aircraft of their own, it will practically close up one of the major markets, the United States. Airco offered Boeing to give up on their project and work with them in the development of the DH-121 jointly, but it didn't work out. In the end, the guys from Seattle decided to build their own aircraft. There were even quite a few scandals, according to which de Havilland gave in a whole lot of secret technologies to their direct competitor, hence facilitating the development of the future Boeing 727. Once all these issues were settled and it became clear who would be building the airliner, Airco officially announced in 1958 the DH-121 project, and BEA placed an order for 24 units with an option for another 12. But the adventures did not end there. The already finished configuration had to be changed again in 1959. The originator of these changes was the initial customer, BEA. They thought that the passenger traffic would not be as intensive, so the HS-121 would be too big with its 111 seats. In addition to that, they would need an aircraft to fly to Europe, so its range also turned out to be too long. The situation made obvious one of the problems of the British air industry, where the manufacturers would build their planes based on the requirements of the key customer instead of general market studies. 
But this is how the things used to work. Besides, in case of a conflict, BEA could opt for the competing project, which would be the ruin of the Haviland. The capacity was reduced to 97 seats and the range was cut in half, down to 1500 kilometers or 800 miles. This required a massive redesign and replacement of onboard equipment, including the engines, which did not help one bit with the project realization schedules, especially with the Boeing 727 nipping at the heels of the Brits. The new version was presented in 1960 at the Farnborough Air Show. This is when its name, Trident, was made public. At the same time, the competition between the British manufacturers on the program had ended. Airco ceased to exist, and the Haviland went on to join the Hawker Siddeley Group, while Hunting joined the BAC, where they developed the BAC-111 project. The DH-121 project went on under a new name, HS-121. So, the HS-121 Trident was the first mid-range trijet with engines placed in the aft section of the fuselage. The aircraft was fitted with a clean design swept wing and a T-tail. The wingspan of the different versions of this plane ranged from 27.4 meters 89 feet, to 30 meters 98 feet. The high-lift devices were quite classic for its time. Large flaps, ailerons, spoilers and slats on each wing console. The power plant consisted of three Rolls-Royce Spey engines with a thrust ranging between 46 and 53 kilonewtons. These engines were installed in the aft section of the plane, two in separate nacelles on the sides, with the third one inside the fuselage, with an S-shaped air intake coming out above, right in front of the fin. Speaking of exotic configurations, the later and the largest versions of the Trident had four engines. Go figure that out. I will dive into this a bit later, once we get to the evolution of the Tridents. The people in charge of designing the airframe had quite a challenge. The airplane had to be very fast, and at the same time, it had to have an acceptable takeoff and landing performance. Hence the reason it had quite a high wing sweep, whereas its area and mechanization had to compensate for that. A similar approach was adopted during the creation of its brothers. The mission was accomplished. The Trident flew on heights reaching 11 kilometers, 35,000 feet, at a cruise speed of 506 knots, 937 kilometers per hour, which is quite fast by modern standards. Its takeoff and landing performance was not record-breaking, but it was quite decent for the 1960s. The airplane got quite an exotic landing gear design. The overall configuration was the usual tricycle. The main landing gear unit was quite buff, with four wheels in a row, which allowed it to operate on low-quality runways. When extended and retracted, this landing gear was spin around in order to fit into the wing stub. Something similar can be seen in military transports. But the interesting stuff does not end there. Looking at the plane from the front perspective, yes, the nose gear is offset from the center. A true perfectionist's hell. The thing is that the airplane was fitted with some really advanced avionics which required lots of space and it was placed under the cockpit. Hence, in order to make up some room for it, the front landing gear was moved two feet to the left and it was being retracted not towards the front but sideways. Speaking of avionics, here the customers gave the engineers an even more serious challenge. There is a problem in the Albion, lots of fog. As a result, oftentimes, due to the poor visibility, the flights had to be delayed or the planes had to be redirected to other airports, which was a real problem for the airlines. Hence, right from the start of the Trident's development, it was decided to solve this problem once and for all. The creators of this airplane took pride in the cutting-edge avionics and automatic systems it had. The cockpit was designed for a crew of three, two pilots and a flight engineer. All of the systems were redundant. Sometimes, the Trident was even called the Triplex. Three engines, three hydraulic systems, three crew members. The fight against fog led to a true breakthrough. The introduction of a completely automatic landing under poor visibility conditions. Already the first mass production machines were capable of carrying out Category 2 instrumental landings. And a few years later, they were cleared to land under the most stringent Category 3C with zero visibility without limitations on the main stages, starting from the approach and ending with the taxiing upon landing. Just a reminder, this was the beginning of the 1960s. Another interesting bonus inside the cockpit was the navigation system. The information was fed from the onboard meters and radar into the processor, which determined the aircraft position. The interface consisted of a panel with a map that moved around it, and a special stylus would draw the flight trajectory. 
a kind of proto-navigation system. Truly, imagination, skill and ingenuity in action. Something similar was used by the Soviet aviators when they created the navigation system for the supersonic Tu-144. The passenger cabin was 3.44 meters or 11.3 feet wide, which was a bit less than in the Boeing 727 or the Tu-154. Its arrangement assumed 5 to 6 seats in a row in the dense versions and 4 in the business class. It was decided not to overcomplicate the exits, so there was no air stair in the aft. The passengers embarked and disembarked the aircraft via two doors, one in the front and another one in the center, right in front of the wing. The prototype of Trident 1 made its maiden flight on January 9, 1962 and initiated a test program that lasted until 1964. Finally, in 1965, the airliners were introduced into the fleet of the initial customer, BEA. After that, the MERS company decided to expand its customer pool and started the search for new clients. This is when the consequences of decreasing the passenger capacity came afloat. It turned out that unlike BEA, many other customers, mostly the American ones, needed a larger plane with a longer range, just like the one de Havilland was initially designing. This marketing mistake cost the company a big chunk of the market. The airlines preferred the Boeing 727. However, some measures to improve the performance were introduced, such as additional fuel tanks and greater mass of the Trident 1C variant, which ended up being the basic model. The aircraft weighed 52 tons and had a range of 3200 kilometers, 1700 miles. There was an active development of different versions. Almost immediately, the Trident 1E was born, with an increased takeoff weight, an improved wing, forced engines, and a capacity of 108 passengers. The airplane was not bad, but it did not gain popularity. Only 15 units were built. Hawker Siddeley initiated the development of the 1F model with an increased seating density, which could take in between 115 and 149 passengers. In fact, the project was of such a scale that the aircraft even got a new name, Trident 2E, extended range. The new SPE 512 engines rendered maximum thrust. The wing received full-grown slats and a larger wingspan due to new wingtips. The takeoff mass reached 64.6 tons, 142.5 thousand pounds, and the range increased to 4,300 kilometers, 2,300 miles. This version became the most popular. Hawker Siddeley delivered 50 units of the Trident 2E, which ended up in the fleets of not only British, but also European and Chinese airlines. In fact, the aircraft was highly regarded in China, and one of them was used by Mao Zedong. Automatic landings were successfully tested, and since the mid-60s were actively used in the motherland of this plane. It was a game-changer for BEA. Back then, many carriers would experience lots of troubles due to bad weather, whilst their tridents were flying with barely any limitations. Coming up next was an even more extensive modification that would lead to a substantial growth in passenger capacity. The Boeing 727 was already there, and it was an aggressive competitor not only in America, but already in the rest of the world. The project was initiated in 1965. Thanks to its longer fuselage, the Trident 3B could accommodate 180 passengers. This is when the aviators came across one serious problem. The engines were too weak. After all, the Spey engines could not be forced infinitely, and the takeoff weight could not be increased without additional thrust. A complete engine replacement would also require considerable design changes, and there was no time and no money for that. In the end, they came up with quite an uncanny solution, using the fourth engine. They placed an additional Rolls-Royce RB162 with 23 kN of thrust in the tail above the central engine. This gave a 15% increase in overall thrust. It was quite a controversial solution, but the options were scarce. This engine was more like a booster, used only during takeoff on short landing strips, in hot weather, or high altitude conditions. The rest of the time it was just a dead weight in the aft of the airplane. Meanwhile the fuel capacity still had to be reduced, which led to a substantial reduction in range to just 3600 kilometers, 1900 miles. But the time of the aircraft was coming to an end. Already during the development of the 3B model, it was getting obvious that the problems it had were getting harder and harder to solve. Only 26 units of the Trident 3B were built, and just two Super Trident 3B with an extended range came out of the assembly lines. 
Hooker Siddeley had high hopes for military orders, specifically maritime patrol aircraft. But in the end, this role was given to the modifications of the late comets, the Nimrod planes. Safety-wise, these airliners were average for their time. During the entire operational history, they were involved in 8 crashes, with a total number of 368 casualties. This is not a good number, especially if you consider that little more than a hundred of these planes flew around. By the end of the 1970s, it became clear that the Trident's journey was about to end. In this competition, Boeing just crushed its British cousin. When the production of the aircraft ceased in 1978, there were just 117 Tridents all over the world, while the Boeing 727 was produced up until 1984, and 1,832 of those planes were built. The beginning of the end for the Tridents came in the 1980s, when the new noise and emission regulations started clipping their wings. With all of their complications, reduced capacity and old engines, these airliners were already on the losing side, and now they were thrown under the bus. Already then, in the 80s, its largest operator, British Airways, which inherited BEA's fleet, started phasing these planes out. In the rest of the world, their operations came to an end by the mid-90s. Such a sad story. Development delays, erratic marketing and modification problems hindered the evolution of what initially was a very promising project. Boeing's creation had taken over most of the international market, while the socialist bloc was ruled by the 2154. The British just stayed without a spot under the sun. But of course, the Tridents won't be forgotten. In any case, the amount of technologies and design solutions it features is quite impressive, especially if you take into account the time when they were created. This airliner failed, but it paved the way for others, and its legacy, one way or another, found its place in newer and more successful airplanes. This is it for the day. Techie planes, fast flights, and soft landings to you.